With that, Ms. Ms. Barnes, will you call the first case, please? Yes, Your Honor. S20A1522, Ryan Alexander Duke versus the state, John Merchant for appellant, Jennifer Hart for appellee. Mr. Merchant, can you please confirm that you can hear and see everybody okay? Yes, Mr. Chief Justice, I can hear you and see everybody just fine. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Hart, you the same? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Mr. Merchant, you may begin when you're ready. Uh, may, may it please the court, Mr. Chief Justice, your honors. Uh, my name is John Merchant, along with Ashley Merchant and Evan Gibbs. Uh, I represent uh, Ryan Duke, the appellant in this matter, uh, who is an indigent criminal defendant. Uh, this is a pretrial murder appeal. Uh, the issue presented in this case is whether or not Mr. Duke, as an indigent criminal defendant, is entitled to ancillary services, including expert uh, assistance and the assistance of an investigator uh, under the 6th and 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution and Georgia's Indigent Defense Act when he elects to use pro bono counsel. Well, Mr. Murch, I know Ms. Hart's going to take issue with your first contention, which is that he's, in fact, indigent. Is, to what extent has that been firmly established? Well, Your Honor, uh, the trial court initially made a finding uh, that Mr. Duke was indigent, and as, as, uh, the trial court in the second order uh, did not address that specific issue, but uh, it presents a question of statutory construction uh, under the Indigent Defense Act because it's a matter of first impression. Uh, in Georgia, other states have considered uh, and, and ruled on this issue, but for here, it's a matter of first impression. So in Plummer v. Plummer, uh, this court uh, set out the standard for evaluating uh, and how you construe a statute um, and uh, in Plummer v. Plummer, 305 Georgia 23, uh, 2019, this court advised that uh, when interpreting a statute, the court gives the text its plain and ordinary meaning, views the text in the context it appears and reads it in its most natural and reasonable way. Uh, and also for purposes of context, the court will look uh, to other provisions of the statute and other constitutional statutory and common law. So if we do that in this case, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, and we look at the language of the statute, our opinion is that Mr. Uh, Duke did not sacrifice or waive his right to counsel of his choice uh, simply uh, because he elected to use pro bono counsel. Our Mr. Mr. Merchant, let me, let me ask you along those same lines. Is there a different analysis, uh, indigency analysis, for purposes of determining indigency for appointed counsel versus uh, the indigency provisions under the act that provide for other resources to be used, to be considered in determining indigency of the particular defendant. Yeah, well, if I understand your honor's question, it, it really boils down to what is the interpretation of other resources and whether or not the ability to retain pro bono counsel is the same as getting an appointed lawyer. And of course, this, this court has always uh, uh, explain that when you are appointed counsel and you don't have the ability to find other private counsel, your rights with regard to your, your uh, respective choice of counsel are somewhat circumscribed. Uh, that's not true with pro bono counsel, which is a situation we have here. Um, if you look at the plain language of the statute, it certainly doesn't exclude pro bono attorneys. And if you look at the context of the language where other resources is contained, uh, it follows right after uh, the definition of indigency, which is someone who makes less than 150% of the poverty guidelines. So if you read those two pieces together, clearly the intent of other resources is other financial resources, which Mr. Duke admittedly does not have and the state has not contended he has. Uh, the only contention here is that because he's able to get a, a free lawyer, that that somehow constitutes other resources. Uh, if, if we construe other portions of the statute, though, uh, we, we, we find other evidence that the General Assembly did not intend to exclude pro bono counsel. Mr. Hart, if, if someone, instead of you being pro bono counsel, there was a GoFundMe account and you were being paid, um, would that be other resources? I mean, why, why are not attorney services are valuable? Why are in-kind services not considered resources. Well, I, I think if we can, in, uh, this this is the point I was uh, just getting ready to raise, uh, Your Honor, is that if you look at, there's in another portion of the statute, it refers to uh, uh, the director providing uh, assistance in the form of investigative resources and other resources to quote, other attorneys. Um, in section 1712 uh, B1, uh, that's the section that identifies other attorneys without a definition. Uh, the definition section of the IDA actually identifies a public defender, uh, a circuit public defender, 
And the General Assembly, if they had intended other resources to uh, uh, mean pro bono lawyers, they could have said so in the definition section or excluded pro bono attorneys from the, the, the phrase other attorney. They didn't do that. Which, uh, can you say which section you were referring to there? Yes, Your Honor. It's 1712B1, uh, B I believe. Well, 1712 what B1? 5B1. 5B1, sorry, yes, Your Honor, 5B1. Under that, that, that refers to, quote, other attorneys, and that's in the section that identifies uh, the, the obligation of the director to provide services uh, to the indigent defendant. And looking at the, the, the statutory scheme overall, then, um, and looking at the plain language of the statute, we don't have an exclusion of pro bono lawyers. And we also, uh, if we read all these in context together, as, uh, as Plummer requires us to do, then the overall scheme uh, suggest that the, the General Assembly didn't intend to exclude uh, pro bono lawyers. Um, Council, what, what about what about uh, low bono? I mean, in other words, what if, what if it had been a steeply discounted uh, rate for services and that exhausted uh, a particular defendant's financial funds, uh, whatever that discounted rate was, would your argument be the same or would, would is, is, does it have to be pro bono for your argument to attain? No, I, I don't think it needs to be pro bono, Your Honor, but I do think there's a qualitative difference between a free lawyer and someone who's being paid. And of course, the determination of whether or not uh, a, a minimal amount of attorney's fees for one particular lawyer is sufficient enough to overcome the definition of indigent person in the statute, of course, is a matter for, uh, in, in this particular case, because we're traveling under the IDA, would be for the, the, the counsel to make a determination. Um, in, in a different context in years past, it would have been the trial court. But uh, the, the review of that would be the question about whether or not uh, the, the defendant had the right to expert services. For instance, if and there's another case that will be before the court shortly, Green versus State, uh, where uh, this merchant and I are counsel uh, for a defendant and, and being paid uh, by family members, but he has no money to pay for experts. In that scenario, I think the defendant also is entitled uh, to, to expert assistance at the state's expense, but it's a different inquiry. And in that particular case, it's a county uh, issue, not an IDA issue, because Douglas County had opted out. So I, I, the, the fact that you're indigent doesn't necessarily under the IDA entitle you to expert assistance. That's kind of a separate question. Can I ask you on the constitutional side, it, it's quite clear from the U.S. Supreme Court case law that a state can say, if you can't afford a lawyer, uh, we will provide you a, a competent conflict-free lawyer and you've got to take that lawyer or you're on your own, right? Yes. And it, it also seems clear under ache or achy, however you pronounce it, on the expert services side, a state can say, um, we will provide you an expert. There's some dispute in the US Supreme Court about whether that expert can actually be the same expert the state is using, but we will provide you an expert so that you have the opportunity to present expert evidence and develop it. But we, we can tell you which expert we're going to give you and you either take that expert or you're on your own, right? Well, I, I, I don't think in this context that would be appropriate because the... Uh, no, wait, if just under Aki. So let's say you have, you have a public defender and, and you say, I need an expert. Under Aki, the state can, it seems quite clear. I mean, Aki says you don't get an expert of your choice. And, and the dispute and the circuit split is actually whether the state can say, use our expert, use our GBI expert. Uh, medical examiner, or whether the, you even get kind of a defense expert, right? Well, I think, well, I, th I think McWilliams versus Dunn, which is the Supreme Court case that was decided in 2017, sort of addressed that issue, Your Honor, and, and held that it's not enough uh, that the state gives you some access to an expert that may or may not be neutral. You're entitled to your own defense expert. No, actually, okay. That is a complete misreading of that case. That was the cert issue granted, but the majority actually refused to address that question. And the, the four dissenters said they should have addressed that issue. And, but that is the issue, that's the circuit split. But, but under neither side of that analysis, do you, does a indigent defendant get to pick his expert? 
The only question is whether you get the expert the state gives you for the defense expert or whether the state can actually say you don't even get kind of an independent expert. You have to use the same expert we use. Well, right? what, 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 well uh, what I would suggest, Your Honor, is that all we're asking for is to have the same rights to experts that he would have if he had a public defender. So in the context of the public- What, defender, what is the best case for the proposition that the constitution entitles you to that? Because here's, here's my reading of the case law. My reading of the case law is that although there is some disagreement, particularly among state Supreme Courts, as to that proposition under the Sixth Amendment, the better reading is that under the Sixth Amendment, the state can tell you if you want access to all the state funded stuff, you got to go through the public defender system. So it seems to me that if you're going to prevail on that argument, you have to prevail under the due process theory and convince us that somehow due process leads to a different conclusion. What's the best case for due process pointing to a different conclusion? The trial court's order in this case that the defendants are, need these experts. The that's, not a binding, that's not a binding case though. And, and to that end, you know, there, there was a helpful amicus brief that listed other states that have come to the conclusion that you want here. Did those states decide it under the Sixth Amendment or did they decide it under due process like Justice Peterson was asking or did they decide it under some other line of authority and, and why should that be persuasive here? Well, I, I would just, uh, if we back up to the 20,000 foot level, Your Honor, I, eight, eight said states, you have to make sure that there's an adequate and effective representation in your, in your, in your representative states and that in, involves uh, at, some, at some point expert services. If, if yeah, Mr. Yeah. Duke decided to, you know, had accepted a public defender, there is no dispute that he would be entitled to experts. The question really is, is his decision instead to accept your assistance, does he still have access to state funded experts? And I don't think the 20,000 foot view answers that fairly nuanced question. Well, if we if we take the position that the IDA was the General Assembly's attempt to implement the due process rights that Mr. Duke has under AIC, and, and we have to assume that because they implemented the statute after that decision was handed down, we and we know for a fact that the General Assembly intended to create a, a statewide system of public defense that was uh, had the ability to give indigent defendants uh, the appropriate resources. If we look at due process through that lens, then what we need to do is evaluate whether the IDA itself provides a specific right. And the other states that have dealt with this have, for the most part, um, done that through their own state uh, indigent defense statutes. In New Mexico, for example, Arkansas, both of which have uh, language is very similar to our IDA language related to indigency. And in both of those cases, the Supreme Courts uh, held that due process and the state statute require that the defendant be given access to those materials and those resources, even if he elects to use something other than the public defender, whether he's pro se, whether it's- I, I just wanna be clear, cause your answer to why is it a due process right seems to be it's a statutory right. And, and that does seem to be the, the main basis for the other states holdings that have gone your way is their statutes are much clearer about, about this issue. Um, so Mike, just to be clear, what is your best due process or Sixth Amendment case? Because my problem is it, it seems quite clear that you don't get a choice, that if the state says public defender or you're on your own for lawyers, that's your choice. And if the state says, here's an expert we'll give you, but we're gonna tell you who the expert is, and it might even be our own expert, or you're on your own, that's okay under the due process clause. And I'm trying to figure out when you put those two together, somehow you get more rights. So that if you choose a pro bono lawyer, you suddenly get an expert of your choosing rather than an expert that uh, the state tells you you can get and have funded. Well, what I, what I will say, Your Honor, and after this, I'd really like to reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal, but the, the, all I can say is there's been very little guidance from the Supreme Court on this issue beyond the need for a psych expert. 
And the states have been left to implement the, the tenants of ache. And the way we have done that in Georgia is through the IDA. So the only lens through which I can explain to your honor that, that there's a due process anchor here is through the implementation of the act and the right that it guards, which is an important right. Uh, and which on rebuttal, I can talk about Roberts and with the intersection of Roberts is. Well, and let me ask you this, Roberts Mr. Murphy, you, due process. You, you mentioned the IDA. Why isn't it a solution under the IDA for you and the Public Defender Council to reach an agreement where they can contract with you to provide the services and then be under the umbrella? And I'm going to ask Ms. Ms. Hart the same question. Yeah, I, when I asked Brandon Bullard that question uh, at the hearing, at the ex parte hearing on, uh, you know, in the trial court, he said that we were not able as private lawyers to contract with the council. It was impossible. Because uh, I asked what's him, you, that. what's I, your I, view? My view is that we certainly should be able to, even as pro bono counsel, establish an employment relationship with the council so that Mr. Duke would be entitled to these services, which he otherwise would be, but for the lack of an appointment of a public defender. And, and would you. you accept whatever, I, there's some limited supervisory authority that, that uh, attaches for GPDC when they enter into those agreements? Is that something you would be willing to accept? Well, what I would say, Your Honor, is that we're willing to accept any limitations that the public defender is willing to accept, provided that it gets him adequate access to the, the resources he needs. Uh, and the administrative concerns that the state has raised are all the administrative concerns that are also true for the public defender. Uh, and with that, Your Honors, I would uh, like well, to well, just before, because I want to make sure of this. Other than asking somebody at a hearing, hey, can we do it? And they saying, no, you can't. What efforts have you made to actually require GPDC to enter a contract with you if the IDA requires it or if the IDA even allows it. What, what efforts have you made with GPDC to enter a contract which would resolve all these problems because it would provide the funding source, it would provide the supervision. So what have you done other than litigate other issues to actually enter a contract with GPDC? Well, let me first say, I don't think we're required to do that. I don't think the IDA, IDA requires that, but even assuming that, that that were required, what we did do was we applied uh, just as any other public defender would to the council for uh, services. Uh, we were very specific in the request and it's the same request that we sent to the trial court and it was denied. Um, and so to the extent that we were able to without a contract, we did apply for those services and, and that request was denied, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merchant. Ms. Hart. Yes, sir. Um, to go to the first question that was addressed by Chief Justice Melton, um, the state is in fact contesting whether or not the defendant is indigent. Um, specifically related to this issue, we believe that the other resources under um, that he has are those of a pro bono attorney. Um, we've also discussed in our brief the fact that he has other resources related to specifically his story. Um, have you, and, and have you cross appealed the trial judge's determination of indigency? The determination of indigency only came with an ex parte um, order. It was not decided in the order that is before the court today. So have, 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 you, have you challenged that determination on appeal at any point? We challenge it before the superior court judge, and he did not rule on it. So okay, I don't. But you've but you've not brought it up on appeal. No, sir. Okay, so we're not talking about that today. Okay, my understanding was Chief Justice Melton had that question, but I will move on then. So moving well, on, we can talk about whatever the Chief Justice wants, but you are not you are not challenging that determination in this appeal, correct? I I just because you haven't actually appealed. We have not cross appealed. Okay. Correct. Can I just ask, um, who makes that call under the ID, at least for purposes of the IDA, who decides indigency? The Georgia Public Defenders Council. I think it's pretty clear in the statutes that the determination of indigency, obviously it has to be under the guidelines um, that are listed within the statute, but it is left to the GPDC to enact what procedures and what um, methods they will take to ensure that the information they're receiving is accurate. Um, and so that is left to the GPDC, which is one of the reasons that we feel like the, G the Georgia chose to include this with under the IDA because there is a um, council. For statutory which, purposes, but is that dispositive of the constitutional issue? As it relates to due process issues or 
either either Sixth Amendment or due process. I mean, indigent defendants have both a due process and a Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Can Georgia pass a statute that essentially sort of cabins the scope of what indigency is without there being a separate constitutional consideration? In the way that they have, I believe they can, yes, sir, because it specifically references um, other resources, um, that being that they therefore takes them outside the ability of, or excuse me, outside being an indigent defendant. So I do believe that it does not violate due process or Sixth Amendment and the way the IDA is written currently, has because GPDC it decided, sorry. has GPDC decided indigency in this case? It seems like at least initially they found that he was indigent because he got a circuit public defender. So what has have, have they made a different determination since that point? Yes, sir. They did initially because he was represented by a public defender for, I believe, um, upwards of 15 months. However, at the time that Miss Merchant reapplied for the public defender services on behalf of Mr. Duke, um, the local public defender did deny the services and indicated that essentially that he did have other resources, which were pro bono attorneys. And so at this point, he has been denied representation as having other resources. Counsel, is, is, it, is it sufficient for something to be categorized as other resources if those resources are not adequate to get the thing sought? I mean, it, it's like saying, uh, you know, I'm indigent and I can't afford uh, my rent and my rent is $1,000 a month uh, and I now have $100. I have other resources, but isn't it, I mean, isn't it implicit in the notion of something being another resource that that resource is adequate to meet the need? Under the cases, I don't believe so. If you look at Ake or, or Akey, I'm glad I'm not the only one who doesn't know how to pronounce it. I'll pronounce it as Ake. Um, Ake specifically references that the reason they decided it that way relates to the due process of someone cannot be treated differently solely because of the fact that they are indigent. Um, not paid attorneys or, or persons who are non-indigent um, have to make this decision every day. They can choose to go with an attorney let's, that's... Let's back, let's back it up. Let's take it away from the experts. Someone comes to the public defender and uh, applies for representation. I'm indigent. Yes, yes And they're, they're determined indigent because they don't have resources. I mean, in other words, they don't have uh, the ability to hire an attorney. Correct. The Christmas comes and goes and somebody gives them a $200 cash gift. They now have other resources, right? I mean, in other words, in sort of the strict sense of those words, they have other resources, but they're not sufficient resources to hire an attorney. Are they not still indigent? In that situation, they would be, but here those other resources are in fact attorneys. And as I believe yeah, presiding but, Justice But Tommy, that's not what he's asking for. What he's asking for is an expert. They're looking for experts and they don't have money for experts. Under, again, I under AIC, the state has provided them the ability to get that and the other resources takes them outside of the indigency. But, no, no, so let's talk to process for a let's, second. Let's, let's, right. let's, 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 hold, let's hold the line on, on which argument we're making. I'm just simply asking about indigency, not about what, what other offers the state or other avenues the state have made to satisfy the need. But the argument that, that you are no longer indigent because you have other resources which aren't sufficient to get the thing that you need seems odd to me. I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how the state would say that that would stop you from being indigent. It may be that you remain indigent and the state's solution is that there's a one-stop shop for you. If you're indigent for legal services or expert services, you have to go to the Public Defenders Council and the state has solved it as that's it. It's a one-stop shopping offer. I get that argument. I don't get the argument that you cease being indigent. If I need two things and 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 I have one of them, but I don't have the resources to get both things. I, I seem to be still indigent. Under the statute specifically, the language as to other resources references other resources that would allow them to have representation. So under the statute, the, defini the definition of indigency is, it, is not is related it, to the resources for other things, but resources isn't the case for law, isn't the case law clear, Isn't the case law clear that in some cases, not all, access to experts is part of representation. 
Yes, sir. And if we don't have pro bono expert services being offered, I mean, that is to say, there's not compulsory, a pro bono attorney doesn't have the ability to go out and force an expert to become pro bono as well, right? Absolutely. Yes, sir. So that's what I'm trying to get at is how is it that I have other lawyer services, other lawyer resources mean that I stop being indigent if, if in fact I'm entitled to to expert resources. And I understand that's a, a, in its own question, but if I need them, right, if, if, if it is true that I require expert services to have adequate representation, how does the fact that I have enough resources in this case, because they're, they're, they're free, how does that solve that second question? And again, I, I have to go back to the fact that our statute, as it is written, specifically the other resources that we are talking about here relate to other resources that allow you to have an attorney um, and without having undue, um, without being an undue burden. And, and, and I understand, I believe, just as- Can we, can we question, pivot to the due process question that yes, really is squarely presented here? There is a constitutional right to select counsel of your choice, right? Assuming Absolutely. you can pay for them. Yes, sir. If there is a constitutional right to select counsel of your choice, and an indigent person is offered free counsel, counsel yes. that they don't have to spend money on. Why do they surrender their constitutional right to state funded experts by exercising their constitutional right to select counsel of their choice? Because AIC specifically left it to the states as to how to implement the rights under the due process. Why is the way the state has implemented this right, according to your reading of the statute, rational? I get, I get the state interest in, in preserving the public fisc and, and ensuring that funds are used efficiently. But, but Mr. Duke's lawyers are not costing the state anything. Why is it rational for the state to insist that if Mr. Duke wants a little bit of money for experts, he also has to accept the state-funded public defender at greater cost to the state than than merely continuing with his pro bono counsel. So the reason I think that it's rational is the oversight that's provided by the GPDC. And when you look at that, there are certain things the GPDC is required to consider. Yes, the, the, the so, fiscal- So So why, why isn't Mr. Duke entitled to experts under the oversight of GPDC with his pro bono counsel? Based on um, our reading of the statute and the decision of the court, the court specifically held, the trial court specifically held that those services were bundled. And but, but, if, but, if, but why that, is that rational? Because if it's not rational, that's a separate due process problem. Uh, again, my reading of it and my belief is that it is rational because of the oversight. There are certain things that the GPDC does that pro bono attorneys are not going to do. They're not going to determine his indigency. Here, yes, he was initially determined to be indigent. Okay, but just hold, don't go back to indigency because let's assume he's indigent. Yes, because, sir. Okay, if if you have an indigent defendant, why is it rational to say the state needs to save money and protect its money by spending more money, paying for a lawyer and experts rather than just paying experts? And why is it rational? So that part's completely irrational. Why is it rational to say, but we still want to kind of have some oversight of who the experts are and how much is, you know, is being spent on that side? Why can't GB, GPDC contract? This was kind of where we ended the last argument. Why can't they contract with um, pro bono counsel to put them under the auspices of the IDA? I don't think that there's anything that prevents them from tra contracting with them. I also don't think there's anything in the IDA, however, or in, in the due process that requires it. Um, here, he had public defenders under the IDA. He chose, it was his decision to go outside of the IDA. But that, gets, that gets back to the question that Justice Peterson asked, which is what happens when there's a collision between two constitutional rights? He exercised one right to counsel. Why does that necessarily impair his right to get experts, which he would argue is part of his due process right. I mean, it, it, your, your answer is presupposing the correctness of your argument instead of really confronting that, the nub of that question. So to, to answer your question again, I think it goes back to that AIC has left it to the states. Our state has determined this is how we're going to do it. And in, 
all, there are lots of situations and lots of cases in which the courts have looked at the fact that we require defendants to choose all the time. The McGautha case, I think, is the, the best on point related to this. And I know it's a bit of an older case, but it talks about those having to choose between those rights. There are a lot of Sixth Amendment cases saying that. I have not yet read a due process case that says that. A due process case in Magatha, they actually cite to a due process case where they were requiring someone to um, choose between those things. However, I can't cite to you what the case was right now without looking at Magatha, but they actually cite to the fact that following Simmons, they had looked at Sixth Amendment, 14th Amendment, and I can't recall what the other amendment was, I apologize, but that they had in fact required people to make those determinations. Um, and it would be a bit odd to say that a textual right like the Sixth Amendment can force a choice on people, but you know the vague language of the Due Process Clause does not allow you to force a choice on people. On the but, but I'm still trying to figure out, it, it still has to be rational. And, and I'm trying to figure out, I mean, it sounds like you said the GPDC can contract. If they can, and I'm, I will tell you personally, I am annoyed the GPDC uh, did not respond to our invitation to appear here because a lot of these issues are wrapped up with the GPDC and their policies, not you and not the merchants and mm -hmm. their client. Um, and so it's kind of hard to resolve some of this without the agency at issue appearing and being here. But, but it's your view that they could enter a contract with pro bono counsel. I believe under the IDA they could, but I don't think they're required to. And if they were, then what we've essentially done is allowed him under the Sixth Amendment to choose his counsel and then force the state to contract with them. Well, but um, what, what would be, the contract could be limited to the same thing you say the IDA and the state are allowed to do, which is control the use of experts and the funding for experts. So you mean they would not be paid contract? They would not be paid right. in the contract. No. They would simply be getting experts. Well, the experts would be paid just like they would be if he chose. A, a but the lawyers wouldn't. But the, the lawyers, lawyers would. Not. It's, it's clear he doesn't have that. That that no one can make GPDC select state paid counsel of the defendant's choice. But it is not at all clear to me why GPDC couldn't and shouldn't contract with pro bono counsel that will cost them nothing simply for the purpose of ensuring the provision of experts with oversight. And I share the presiding justices sense that it is regrettable that GPDC uh, chose to stay out of this case when they really are at the nub of it. And I agree with uh, both of your, your honors. I believe GPDC should have um, filed an amicus brief. And I believe this is really a question more prone to them or more um, given to them. However, to answer your question again, no, I don't think there's anything that prevents them from contracting, but I also don't think there's anything in our statute that requires it, nor anything in the constitutional Council, requirements Council, that requires ask, it. Let me ask this about the question uh, the presiding justice asked about rationality. Does does the rationality ha have to be considered with respect to the individual transaction? That is to say, do we have to limit it to the conversation about, well, here you're either paying for lawyer and expert or just expert, and that doesn't seem rational? Or could it be that the state can establish a, a system that over, over the statewide application seems rational because you don't want to have these arguments about who's expert, who's picking what expert, what rate are we paying them, what does the contract say? Back to Justice Peterson's question about who has oversight in an employment relationship with the attorney and simply say, we don't want to do that. We want to have one. Can that be can can that be rational, even though the individual transaction would not be? It could be rational. But again, I think that would be something that would have to be left to the legislature. And they've chosen not to do that. Is it but rational as applied to Mr. Duke? As applied Because to decisions have to be rational as applied to individuals, not simply rational about the whole. I mean, this isn't a facial challenge to the statutory structure. It's a challenge as applied to Mr. Duke. I think as it was applied to Mr. Duke, it's absolutely rational that there be some oversight. Again, it goes back to the, uh, the oversight the GPDC would get. But I'm sorry. they're refusing to provide that oversight. Right. Correct. I mean, that's what I'm They're refusing to, to provide it. I don't think they're required to provide it at this point, but I think that it would be rational for them to do so. I'm trying to figure out why if, if GPDC 
can contract with people who are lawyers who are, you know, there's no question has been raised about competency or conflict. So they can, they can contract with the merchants just like they contract with all kinds of other private attorneys to do different things for their clients. All of that comes under the IDA. Normally they have to pay those lawyers, but here if they're pro bono, the state saves money and the GPDC saves resources on that side. Um, they can always you know, put terms in the contract that if the lawyers do things that are not competent, you know, they can they can limit that. On the expert side, they provide the experts and investigators. They do it within a structure that's well established. They do that for lots and lots of private attorneys. They, I don't know why they can't do that here, and I don't know why their refusal to do it here could not be deemed, you know, to at least raise enough constitutional issues to interpret this statute to require them to do it. I agree with you that they could do it and they probably should do it. Um, that being said, I don't necessarily agree that it would raise the constitutional issue because if you go back to AIC, I don't believe that our IDA as it is violates AIC or his right to the attorney of his choice. Um, and specifically, if you look at AIC, again, they go back to the idea that you can't treat him differently than any other non-indigent defendant. And we have this come up with non-indigent defendants all the time. They can choose whether to pay for an attorney who may be a more expensive attorney or pay for an attorney who may not be as expensive and have money for experts. Unless they have an unlimited amount of money, even someone who is non-indigent must decide how to use the resources they have. And AIC specifically talked about- What, what resources does Mr. Duke have? Pres presuming that we're taking the trial court determination of indigency, indigency as read for this appeal, what resources for experts does Mr. Duke have? Mr. Duke has the media attention that has come with this case, but for that, that media that, that brings no money with it. It, it, it actually, I, I would respectfully. What money? Disagree. I mean, Miss, if Mr. Duke is indigent, as the trial court said he was, by definition, he does not have money for experts. The fact that he has notoriety is not is not monetizable at least in any way that that our justice system recognizes i would state that it again i would respectfully disagree but for that notoriety he wouldn't have these attorneys they you're, would never heard the name Mr. that is Duke. a very difficult argument to make and you you are telling that the state wants the criminal defendants to exploit their notoriety um you know in the federal system there's a statute that says if defendants do that, all of the money forfeited to the victim. So, but you're saying that that actually makes somebody a source of revenue that the state encourages. I'm not encouraging that at all. I'm saying that's what's occurred in this case. But so how's that, he supposed to hire an expert? Would not. Um, how's he supposed to hire an expert? He should have gone, he would remain with the public defenders through the IDA. That's so what so represented by the merchants, he has no ability to hire an expert. You would agree? I agree. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Mr. Merchant, I believe you have some time remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I see that I have uh, fewer than three minutes, so I do want to highlight one important thing that has not been discussed yet, and that's the public policy issue at play here and what the effect of the court's denial uh, of Mr. Duke's assertion here will have on the state of Georgia. Uh, Obviously, pro bono work is something that's encouraged by the bar. Uh, I can tell you for myself, Mr. Merchant, you can argue policy up and down, but that's not going to change how I view a statute of the Constitution. So you might want to focus your arguments on the law. Absent a constitutional basis or a statutory basis to tell the state they have to do something that's good policy, that does appear to be an argument more directed at the legislature. Fair enough, Your Honors. Let me please, in the last two minutes, then focus on Roberts and what impact I think the decision, in this court's decision in Roberts and Spate on the right to counsel has on Mr. Duke's rights with regard to- You would agree those are not due process cases though, right? That's Roberts correct. cites only one legal provision and it's the state version of the Sixth Amendment. That's correct, Your Honor. It, it was interpreted under the Georgia Constitution, but it, I, I think it applies with equal force here because the right itself was defined by this court. And essentially what the court said was, we're not focusing on who is asserting the right for the defendant. Um, we're asserting, is he entitled to the right in the first place? So Robert stands for the, the, the position in this case that Mr. Duke doesn't have to choose between his right to counsel and his right to ancillary services under- Do you have a state constitutional claim that is pre 
presented in this appeal? I know most of the focus has been on the federal constitution. Yes, we raised that issue in the, yeah. in, the in the appellate briefs, Your Honor. Um, and so, and I, and I, I think Justice Namius in, in McCullough, uh, you said it would be a, an abuse of discretion to deny uh, a defendant uh, his right, uh, his choice to the counsel, the counsel of his choice, unless there was some countervailing measure that justified the denial. Here, we don't have that. Uh, the, the administrative concerns, the budgetary concerns, none of that is, is, is appropriate. And this court has twice said to the, to the council, I don't care about your budget. In, in Garland v. State, 283 Georgia 201, and in the, the Standards Council case 285 Georgia 169, the court looked at the council and said, money's not enough. We're dealing with someone's constitutional rights. We cannot sacrifice at the expense of some sort of budgetary concern this person's this person's constitutional rights. So twice this court has said that's not enough. And so certainly it can't be enough to force Mr. Duke to choose between his Sixth Amendment right to counsel and his Sixth Amendment uh, right to ancillary services under eight. And for all these reasons, uh, Your Honors, we would uh, respectfully request that this court reverse the decision uh, below and allow him to have these services. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Merchant. Thank you, Ms. Hart. And I do want to thank all the uh, parties who did submit amicus briefs to this court to help us in this case. We'll get back to y'all very shortly. Meanwhile, you be safe and your families as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you.